I love cooking and I love teaching people how to cook. Good food is so important, not just for our health, but for our temperament, and it doesn't need to be complicated. For this series, I've created a set of menus which I hope you will try, either as individual dishes or as a complete and balanced meal. We're so lucky to have some of the best raw ingredients in the world. Let's make the most of them. The quality of raw ingredients in Ireland has always been really good. We may not have been very creative in the past in how we cooked them, but the variety and choice now commonplace in our shops and markets would have been unknown a relatively short time ago. Mozzarella made with Irish buffalo milk from buffaloes grazing outside McCroom in County Cork is one such ingredient. And this dish is a celebration of that wonderful locally made cheese. For the candied julienne of lemon for the mozzarella, you start, strangely enough, with a lemon. And then I'm just going to cut long, thin strips using a, a swivel top peeler, just from top to bottom like that. And try and pair the lemon off, the lemon rind that is, as thinly as possible. The less of the white pith that you get, the better. So backwards and forwards like that. Try and get it nice and fine, because you don't want great big chunks of candied lemon. You want a degree of subtlety going on here. Lovely, like that. So into some cold water. So we're going to bring that up to the boil, drawing bitterness out of the lemon, um, and then making the resulting little lemon strips a lot more pleasant to eat. So while I'm waiting for that to come up to the boil, we can look at the rest of our ingredients. Mozzarella is at the centre of this particular salad. And this is lovely Irish mozzarella from McCroom in County Cork, so it's very exciting to be able to get home-produced mozzarella. Some nice zucchini, not too big. This is perfect. If it was a bit smaller, it would be even more perfect. And then our dressing here is going to be very simply some olive oil and more lemon juice. So this is just starting to simmer on top, which gives me time just to talk about the herb that I'm going to use here, which is marjoram. And marjoram is the perfect herb to draw all of these flavours together. Now, so the water has just come to the boil, so it's been drawing the bitterness out of the skin of the lemon and into the water. So we strain that. And pop that back in there. Now, we need to add some uh, liquid ingredients in here um, to make the glaze that's going to candy the lemon. So, I have a little bit of sugar, because we need sugar to create a candy, that's a fact. So that goes into our container like that, plus the juice of one lemon. So you can use the lemon that you took the strips off to make the little julienne. And then I'm going to add enough water in here, and I'm going to use some of the, of the water we used for just blanching the lemon to bring it just up to 100 mils, so not very much water. So that's that, that's my 100 mils. Just give that a little stir just to make sure that all of your sugar ends up in here, because that's quite important, because it is a very specific measurement. So that goes into the saucepan. And then we're going to cook that until um, it candies. Um, sometimes five minutes, sometimes ten. So what's really important at this stage is when it comes up to a simmer, which it must, that it doesn't boil hard. Because if you boil this hard, you might forget about it, and it would actually turn, the syrup would reduce down to a caramel, and then you've got something completely different as well. And then in about five minutes' time, that is going to end up looking like this which is this beautiful, translucent, candied lemon, and which will live with a little um, sort of syrup around it, which is just delicious. This is such useful stuff. Anyway, once you have that ready, assembling the salad is absolutely simplicity itself. So, zucchini, top and bottom. Now, I like to cut the zucchini quite thinly, but not paper thin, and this is important, because if it's paper thin, you sort of lose some of the texture. I like to cut sort of strips like that, just for aesthetics. And if I start to see quite a lot of the seed like that, I'll move over uh, to the other side and get some more. I mean, it wouldn't be the end of the world, let's face it, but the seeds in the courgette tend to be a little bit watery. Then I'm going to dress those very, very simply with some olive oil. Not too much, a little uh, lemon juice, more lemon juice. 
is very, very fresh tasting. Very, very light. I mean, it's the sort of food I absolutely love. Salt, of course, and pepper. Now, this is perhaps the easiest courgette salad in the world to make. So then we arrange those on our plate. I'm just doing one little portion here. You could make, do a big family-style dish of this for bringing to the table. Then, the mozzarella. Often in Italy, when you're being served mozzarella, you get one ball per person. I sometimes find that a little bit too much. So I'm going to put a half ball of mozzarella on here for the size of the salad I'm making. You can cut it open, but certainly in Italy, they just prise them open like that, so it's sort of slightly torn looking. So that just sits up on top of that. Then, a little of the candied lemon. And then, very importantly, don't forget a little drizzle of that syrup, like that. So the sweetness of the syrup is going to counteract with the um, sharpness of the lemon. And then, as I said earlier on, the perfect herb here is marjoram. So a few sprigs of that. So this is so light, so refreshing, so fresh tasting. And at the time of the year, when our own courgettes are in season in Ireland, and when we can use macroom and mozzarella, sadly we don't have our own lemons yet, this is an absolute simple but beautiful, and I think elegant celebration of a particular time of year. Animal welfare is becoming more and more of an issue, and rightly so to my mind. I'm cooking roast beef on my next recipe, and I happen to know that the farmer who produced the beef that I'm cooking takes extraordinary care of his animals, right up to and including the moment of slaughter. We should care that the animals we eat are content, well looked after and unstressed. And if they are, we will benefit from the wonderful tasting and nutritious meat they provide. It is up to ourselves to check on the provenance of our own food. I'm serving the roast beef with creamed corn and pickled red onions. Definitely not perhaps the first thing to come to mind when thinking about a dish as traditional as roast beef, but they all work wonderfully well together. So I want to get this fabulous piece of beef into the oven. If there's an excess amount of fat on the beef, you can take a little bit off before it goes into the oven to cook, but you must have a nice coating of fat there in the first place, otherwise you won't be ensured a juicy, succulent, sweet tasting piece of beef. And this, as I said, is the sirloin of beef. And it's on the bone. And the cooking the beef on the bone with the feather bones and the rib bones does a couple of things. Most importantly, it keeps flavor attached. And also I think the beef cooks better in this way when it's slightly you know, elevated off the roasting tray. I mean, this is, it's such a joy to have a piece of beef like this to work with. So I'm going to just cut into the beef like that, making sure I'm not going into the flesh. And this will allow the fat, the excess fat to run out. Now, some salt and pepper. Okay, so I've preheated my oven to 240 degrees, a hot oven to get the beef going and to colour it nicely from the beginning and also to get some of the liquid fat to render out and down over the beef so it becomes almost self-basting. Then after 15 minutes I turn it down to 180 degrees um, for the appropriate length of time depending whether you want it rare, medium or well done. Great, while the beef is cooking we can prepare the accompaniments. So the corn puree, I've got some pre-cooked corn and I'm going to put this under the grill with some chili and lime and butter. And then that we're going to render to a puree. So it may seem strange to have that with beef, but I promise you it works beautifully. So just cut the corn like that. So really we've got a sort of a Mexican theme going on here. Lovely. Right, nearly there. So, that's easy so far. Then my chilli, I'm using a medium hot uh, red chilli I prefer to use here. You could use a green chilli, it wouldn't be the end of the world. Now, if you want to, you can remove the seeds of the chilli. You don't have to. Depends how hot you like these things in your house. I'm going to just scrape out the seeds using 
a spoon like that. And if a few of them stay in there, well, that's quite all right too. Like that. And then I'm going to give them a coarse chop. The colours also start to look pretty dramatic shortly when we add the clashing um, red to the yellow. There's a serious fast food colour palette going on there, if you know what I mean. Lime juice, very important, okay? So halve your lime and then squeeze that juice over the corn. And then I like to just cut the lime a couple of pieces and put that in there. Butter and a nice bit of it just going in there like that on top. And then, of course, some salt and pepper. Lovely. Okay, let's break up some of those bits of corn, just a little bit like that. That's it. An odd composition of ingredients at this stage, but it was, this is going to yield something really nice. So that goes in under the hot grill, which I've preheated here. Now, while that's happening, I can prepare the other accompaniments, very simple to serve with the beef, which are some pickled onions. And this really couldn't, you know, it just couldn't be easier. I've got some red onion. It could be a white onion as well if you want to. So I'm just going to cut it in half and then slice because these will collapse. Just like that. So very simply, the sliced onions, some red wine vinegar, or it could be white wine vinegar, Use an Irish cider vinegar here, would be really lovely. And not much of it, as you can see. And then my uh, sugar, just a little bit of sugar, like that. And of course, a pinch of salt. So again, that doesn't look as if it'll amount to very much. Just stir those together, or use your fingers like that. And after a while, those onions will start to collapse down. Okay, lovely, that's those. Now, let's see what's happening under the grill. Ah, oh, yeah, good. So we're starting to get a little bit of colour. Not a great deal of colour has happened yet, but I want plenty of colour by the time I remove them. But we can just see the way that the lime is just getting a little bit of colour there. So stir them around, even things out, and we'll come back to that again in a few minutes. coast of Ireland lives the legend of the giant's causeway. It tells of a giant who, answering a challenge from across the sea, was determined to traverse it. But seeing no passage, he built a crossing where none existed. It's in this place another legendary trail was forged. Bushmills, the first licensed whiskey distillery in the world, a reminder to all that when there is no path, you make your own. We produce our milk off grass in Ireland. Our butter has this creamy golden colour. The taste has always been pure. It's as natural as the day my great-grandfather made the butter. It is so beautiful. The really hot oven has sealed the beef beautifully, so I can turn the oven down to 180 degrees and let it cook for the appropriate length of time. The corn has coloured perfectly under the grill, so now I can make the puree. Tip the corn into a food processor. Make sure to remove the lime skins, but squeeze any remaining pulp into the corn. Pour in some sour cream. Blitz. And then add in a small amount of chicken stock and blitz again. 
you're looking for a dropping consistency like this. Taste it, season it, and set aside for serving with the beef. So my beef has been resting with the oven temperature reduced to about 80 degrees for about a half an hour. And it's hard to understate how important that resting is in terms of the juiciness of the meat when you come to carve it once it has rested, because the juice just sits, relaxes in the meat as it rests, and then you get nice, easy to carve slices. So, um, before I carved the meat, I still have the little feather bones on here. But to carve a slice here, I need to get those off. So put your knife just in there and just go nice and gently. Keep your knife as close to the inside of those bones as possible. So I can feel the bone underneath my knife. And it should just slide off easily like that. Now, it's worth saying definitely there's a delicious morsel of beef there on there for somebody. That could be for yourself um, a little bit later on. So now I'm all ready to carve with no obstructions. Before that, I'm going to put some of my corn puree, just like that. But I really think this is a winning combination of flavours. Now, we're going to have some more well-done beef on the outside, which will suit some members of the family or the table, perhaps. Lovely. The beef looks really wonderful. Now, if you like it more cooked than that, um, you can just leave it in the oven for a little bit longer. Now, that's enough beef to put on there for the moment. Then, the lovely pickled red onions, and I'm going to use my hands to scatter those. My hands are nice and clean. Very little else to add there, except for me, the herb of choice here is coriander, and tying the sort of the, the slightly sort of Mexican element uh, to this dish. I would also definitely serve a few little lime wedges. You could put one or two on the dish if you wanted to. And also, to complete the picture then, some potatoes, which I've roasted with the skins on, and finish them off at the last moment with just a little bit of Irish butter and balsamic vinegar and lots of rosemary. And that combination of that flavour and these flavours works brilliantly together. Squeeze of lime juice on top. It's a delicious meal. Strange as it may seem, but something as summery sounding as this orange and passion fruit granita is particularly appreciated after Christmas when the richer and much-loved traditional flavours are perhaps starting to wear a bit thin. You don't need an ice cream machine to make the granita, just a little commitment to giving it the odd stir as it freezes. The resulting coarse texture is charming and invigorating and gives a totally different experience to eating ice cream or sorbet. So this is what we're trying to achieve with the granita. And it's a particularly beautiful colour in this case uh, with the orange juice and also the passion fruit juice in there. I mean, it is such a really lovely thing and a simple thing to make. For the orange and passion fruit granita, you need obviously oranges and passion fruit. And when I say oranges, I mean orange juice. And an orange juice, believe it or not, comes from one of these round things that you cut in half and squeeze. Uh, it doesn't involve a scissors or a package of any description and you'll be rewarded by just juicing the oranges fresh when you need them because you get fantastic fresh flavour. So some orange juice and then we need to sweeten this with um, a little sugar, not, not sort of too much but enough to make it delicious so that goes in there. Then the other ingredient we need are our passion fruit um, and passion fruit is a really wonderful uh, ingredient, you know, so packed full of, I suppose you, so you could safely call it exotic flavour. So cut them in half. On first viewing, they're not particularly a beautiful thing, but when you get used to the flavour of them, they're really fantastic. And orange and passion fruit, just the two flavours work brilliantly together. So just scoop out the seeds, and then I'll pass these through a sieve. So with our juice, which we'll whisk, as I said, to dissolve the sugar, we're going to put it into the freezer, and we're going to freeze it until it starts to set. And then we simply take it out, and you can bash it up with a fork, and you do that about four or five times. So from the point of view of um, returning to your freezer four or five times, there's definitely, you know, there's a little bit of commitment involved there, 
But, you know, you, when you see a, uh, the word granita on a restaurant menu, you know, it sounds so exotic and out of your reach, I promise you, from the point of view uh, of a kitchen at home, this is such an easy and wonderful thing to do and a lovely way to get plenty of fresh fruit um, into your diet. So that's the passion fruit all scooped out. Now, I'm pushing as much of the juice from the passion fruit through the sieve. And then if you just be getting a sort of a lovely colour coming through. So with this, you need to, do need to show a little bit more commitment here because the more of the flesh that we get from the passion fruit, the flesh that's closest to the seeds indeed, that's the most flavoursome. And that's that little bit of extra flavour that will take this from a 90% to 100%. So when you've gone that far, I think, I've, I've extracted everything I can. I'm afraid to say you haven't. So just keep going like that. Now you see there's virtually nothing. My passion fruit pulp is virtually dry there. Lovely. Let's get all that off there. See, look, the colour of the passion fruit, absolutely lovely. And as I said, the combination of these two ingredients is really fantastic. So, give it a good stir to dissolve the sugar. I'm doing it in a glass bowl here. It could be a plastic container. It doesn't need to be anything fancy. Just something that is freezer-proof. That now goes into the freezer. And when it's sort of semi-frozen and looking somewhat like this one here, just take it out and bash it up again. Like that. And at this point, you could say, isn't that a slush puppy? Well, actually, yeah, it is a slush puppy at this stage. This stage. But when we do repeat this stage, uh, uh, this stage three or four more times, uh, then it will get those rather more um, exaggerated shards of ice that I have in there. OK, so that's going to go back into the freezer to freeze again, bash it up a few more times, and you'll have something utterly simple like this. Now, what will be delicious and also very easy to find with this believe it or not, are the, the humble bananas. So I'm just going to um, slice some banana, sprinkle it with a little caster sugar and some of our lime zest and lime juice. And that is such a nice combination of flavours. So the bananas, I mean, you could just have this as a fruit salad with nothing else. A little bit of lime. So this all makes sense because these um, fruit are sort of neighbours where they grow. So, a little bit of lime juice in there. Like that. And then just a little sugar. Give that a little stir. I can use my um, granita spoon. Okay, so now we're ready to serve. So I like to serve these in glasses. You can use whatever container that suits in your house. So just a little bit of banana into each dish. Make sure you get all of the juice, the lime juice, which is now sort of sweetened with the sugar, in there at some point or other. I'm going to put a few more little bananas in on top in a moment. And then the lovely shards of granita. Lovely. But I think we're about there. A little more of the banana and its juice, just to one side. Like that. And don't forget about that last little bit of juice, which will be packed full of flavour. And one final little flourish of the perfect herb, in this case, which is mint. So let's just not hold back here, like that. And then off to the table, nice spoons, hopefully very, very happy reaction from that. Because in my opinion, given how easy it is to make and delicious it is to eat, there just isn't enough granita in the world.